Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with another round of off-the-cuff answers to questions from my supporters over at Patreon. We're going to get right down to business with Adrian Slider, who says, Scott, I'm glad you enjoy doing these videos because I doubt we're going to run out of questions anytime soon. Yes. Um, do you think there's any realistic proposals for an alternative to chemical rockets for getting into Earth orbit? besides yeeting. And that's obviously a reference to spin launch, uh, something which isn't very good for launching people and probably isn't going to work for economics reasons, but it's not technically impossible. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm actually surprisingly um, pessimistic about alternates to chemical launches. Uh, the reason is that if you look at a chemical propellant system, right, they're putting out ridiculous amounts of energy from chemistry. Now, if you release the same amount of energy via nuclear, you're actually throwing a lot of radiation out there, like you ridiculous amounts. You could probably make a, you know, a nuclear propellant uh, first stage. I'm not sure that's actually possible, but I don't see any physical reason why that couldn't happen. If you get into fusion, uh, yes, but the thing is fusion releases four or five times as many neutrons for the same amount of energy. So, and then neutrons need a lot of shielding. So I'm not sure that I necessarily believe that we might live a, in a, an expanse style future where you have fusion reactors that's blasting propellant out the back, mostly because you need so much shielding that you might as well have a, a chemical rocket. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I do think that you can definitely build large structures like uh, beanstalks, orbital towers, that kind of thing, uh, if you really want to bring your launch costs down. But yeah, the Earth is just a hard problem to solve. Well, antimatter, yeah, antimatter would actually work because while that does throw out a lot of radiation, it's mostly in the form of gamma rays, which are much easier to block than neutrons. You know, people don't realize just how dangerous neutron radiation is. If you do, like, if you do the math on Back to the Future, when they're generating the 1.21 gigawatts in the back of that car, uh, that's giving them a lethal dose of neutron radiation. Anyway, uh, he also asks, do I remember my first Lego set? I don't, it was a town set. And what's my favorite scotch? When I like to talk about scotch, I tend to show, I tend to talk with other people and I, a lot of people just don't get you can taste differences between these things, which they generally consider to be fire water. So I like to show them like a, a Laphroaig compared to, say, a Johnny Walker black label, which is a, a blended one. I actually like the Johnny Walker green label because it's very uh, affordable. Roger Ramjet. Is there a maximum speed that you can reach doing gravity assist, even if you did it multiple times? Yes. So, um, with gravity assist, there's two really important factors. First of all, there's the velocity at which the object you're assisting off is orbiting the parent body. And then there's the density or the mass, because uh, basically you get speed with every, every kick, right, as it flies past. And you can, you can take your initial velocity vector and turn it around to point in the direction of the orbit of the thing you're encountering. So, hypothetically, you could be going head on in an opposite direction and then get switched around and now you're going the same direction as the object at uh, basically twice orbital speed. The problem is to do that, you might have to get too close to the center of the object so that you end up hitting the surface. So you can't do maybe a full turn. But if you had a sufficiently dense object, I think on paper, theoretically, the maximum velocity you could get from a, a single encounter would be to take the escape velocity, because you'd come in at escape velocity going the wrong way, uh, zip around this thing going at orbital velocity and come out with escape velocity plus orbital velocity, assuming you could get close enough to the center. Now, there is another option where you can do an Oberth escape or whatever, where you drop down very close to an object and then use your engines to come out. And what you're essentially doing there is you're by dump firing your rocket engines, you're actually slowing that propellant down and it's dropping into the body at the center and you're gaining that energy. And if you do this around a black hole, you can get relativistic speeds quite easily. Uh, like the, the danger of course is that you have to find a black hole that uh, is sufficiently high mass so that the tidal forces aren't gonna kill you. You know, with swings around black holes, you want the big ones because their tides are weaker. The small ones tend to destroy you. 
Drew Granston asks, uh, without getting into American politics, what do I think about the recent test of China's hypersonic fob delivery system? Let me tell you, there's been a lot of stuff and opinions sent about this, but because many people have opinions on how defense and China and everything should be dealt with, let me tell you, nothing really in the short term is going to change the fact that the US and all the superpowers are built around mutually assured destruction, right? Nobody's going to start a nuclear war, so playing around with weapons isn't going to change the fact that you can't really get into a fight with anyone without ending the world, and nobody wants to do that. I know, I know. Anyway, um, believe it or not, there's actually... <laughs> it's not even clear that that's the case, and also it's a lot easier uh, than some places would make it out to be, and the US has had a lot of work in hypersonic research. They're not being left behind by any means. Robert Whitefield. In an earlier video, you showed the Lance's interesting piston-fed propellant mechanism. It used a gas generator to drive a piston... Uh, pushing hypergolic propellant, right? So this is a video, it's called Look at a Rocket Engine Inside of Another Rocket Engine, and I just showed the propellant system. So could you use a, a piston-fed system for cryogenic propellant? Um, there's no reason why not. It may not be the best system. Um, has anyone considered replacing gas pressurization with a piston inside the tank? So look, there's many ways of dealing with propellant in space. Some spacecraft, uh, they just have these bladders. The, the pistons are an option, but I think when you're putting stuff, once you've got something to space, having a piston is heavier. And also, having a piston system with the guide along the middle and the gas generator is still probably... Uh, heavier than having very small illage thrusters, right? And, you know, you're going to need small thrusters for navigating a ship in space. So they tend to default to the illage thrusters, you know, where they can use pressure-fed fuel and it doesn't matter if it's a little bit gaseous. Okay, um, moving on. Yo, AJ, Dark Matter Axion. Has this been debunked? Is this still a possibility? Ah, <laughs> Okay, I am not a particle physicist, but I understand, right, so, the standard model has quantum chromodynamics. Like, I'm just going to explain what the axiom is, right? Quantum chromodynamics basically predicts that um, the neutron should have a non-zero di electric dipole. Like, the neutron is made of quarks, and while the neutron is neutral, the quarks all have fractional charges. And that would mean that depending upon their orientation, you would have a dipole on the neutron. But when you actually measure neutrons, you don't see this electrical dipole. So that then comes up with, I think you basically have some arbitrary parameter in there that can take like a value from zero to two pi and it looks like it's zero. And there's no nothing in the theory that explains why it would be zero. So they introduced a particle to you know, help with the, the charge parity violation and the axion is the particle to do that. Now, there is an experiment called... Well, so basically, if you if you then assume this exists, then new, the axions would be produced in ridiculous numbers in the earliest parts of the ages of the universe, and could there could be a background of axions in space that would be weakly interacting, uh, but they would still produce mass. Now, there's an experiment called the Xenon 1T. Z, one ton of xenon experiment is looking for, like, the, the recoil of axions hitting things. And 2020, they announced some observations that said maybe we found something, but whether that's an axion or not is definitely open to question. Whether they've actually found something is also still open to question. So it's certainly not debunked. You know, dark matter is one of these things where we keep looking and we keep seeing evidence for it. We still don't know what it is. We There's all sorts of different options out there. But uh, ultimately, people don't like dark matter because it's like, oh, you can't see it. But unfortunately, you can see it when you look at things in gravity. So um, again, lots of possible theories to explain this someday. I long for the day when uh, we have a good one that actually works and solves all the problems. Sand500 says, have you seen the anime Planetess? If so, what do you think about it? I have seen the anime Planetess. Uh, I, I think it's a fine show. It definitely is, is uh, well, it's, it's one of those more hybrid anime things I like. But I actually was, I found out about it because I, well, 
I was approached by an anime fan that makes videos on YouTube asking if I could voice his video about Planet Is, and I was like, hell yeah! So I ended up watching it, and yeah, I really think uh, it is absolutely a fine show, and I can recommend it to people that like anime and uh, space. John Smith. There's a lot of space companies leveraging their technical knowledge to break into new industries. Starlink, Rocket Lab becoming a component manufacturer, etc. Are there untried applications you think the space companies could look into as they're working to gain, be more financially viable in the long term? Um, that's a good question. Like, are there other things that rocket companies can do? I mean, it's interesting to see like Strato Launch decided that they were never going to go work in the launch business and instead pitch themselves as a hypersonic testing platform to capitalize on, you know, hey, we need to spend money on hypersonics. But by the way, in orbit, that's hypersonic. Um, you know, it's been surprisingly hard to find things which are a benefit from space to the extent that they can't be replicated on Earth. Right now, I believe there's at least one company pitching, making very high quality optical fibers in zero G because this is a process that's been demonstrated, but they haven't been able to figure out how to optimize it and make it work on the ground. So those are, you know, if you're looking for something to manufacture in space, then it has to be something that the materials are sufficiently light, the product is sufficiently light, and the equipment is sufficiently light and, you know, doesn't need huge amounts of power. So all that has to work because, like, even if you were literally bringing gold down from space, it would still be more expensive than the cost to launch it, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Will there ever be a killer app that justifies large numbers of people living in orbit? Um, well, for a start, I think uh, space tourism could actually be a legitimate killer app. Like at some point, it just might be better to have a sort of permanent outpost of people, you know, going back and forth. I, I think that if you still have people working, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's one of these things that happens slowly. There are people that live out in the middle of nowhere for things like oil drilling and mineral extraction. You know, there's people right up, way up in the Arctic Circle. Um, but the most like terrestrial equivalent is Antarctica. And that is almost all research. People living at the South Pole, uh, working on telescopes or neutrino telescopes or... Um, you know, geological, biological, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on down there and that has a lot of people. So I guess the first people will be scientists that will be living long term and astronauts obviously to support that. But I don't know how that scales up to large people because, you know, there's going to be a, a definite cost barrier and there's always going to be um, people that just want to keep it pristine. So... I, it's going to happen. I just don't know how exactly it's going to happen. And it could be something as simple as some, you know, very passionate billionaire decides that we need to have people living on other planets because the human race needs it. Um, Bennett Holden, if humans disappeared today, hey, <laughs> and we didn't have a Mars colony... Uh, how long would it take for all man-made satellites in orbit to decay? Uh, I know that GEO satellites are stable. Okay, so basically, yeah, low orbits, you're talking decades. As you go up to about 1,200 kilometers of thereabouts, the inner edge of the Van Allen belt, that would take about 2,000 years. So think back to like Roman times. Like if they launched a satellite into a 1,200 kilometer orbit, it might just be deorbiting today. You go further up to uh, sorry intermediate orbit where you've got a GPS and all those navigation clusters. Yeah, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years, maybe millions of years. Geostationary, yeah, we're possibly talking millions of years. Like the Earth's atmosphere does extend out that far, but it's very, very weak. And I'm going to say, actually, if you have a geostationary satellite that's slowly, you know, falling down over millions of years, it might end up coupled in a resonance to the moon, like because the moon is orbiting at a certain rate and it's actually going outwards and the satellites end up coming inwards. They might get into sync at some point and they're possibly going to get kicked off into space rather than deorbit because you've got a gravitational effect going on. So look, yeah, we, we could be talking millions or more years. Udo Richter, why was the Rosetta spacecraft not soft landed? Okay, you understand that ESA had to end the mission because of the upcoming conjunction. Okay, so 
yeah, he's got very specific. Why did we land it at 0.9 meters per second, right? Why not soft land it? Okay, so yes, the Rosetta spacecraft, as you know, it landed on Comet 69P churyumov gerasimenko which I think I've mispronounced. Uh, first of all, it, they didn't want it to remain in orbit because when it had gone out originally, it had gone into this hibernation to stay, uh, you know, to catch basically because it couldn't get enough power. And then it came in and rendezvoused with with uh, the comet. Now, the comet, actually, its aphelion was even further out than the initial aphelion, so they didn't think that the spacecraft would be able to survive. Um, so they came to this decision to land it on the surface, and they did it basically by going from orbit, just stopping its engines and having it fall down, and it was doing science all the way. Now, they could have tried to bring it into an even lower orbit and perform that last burn so it didn't fall as far or as fast. But the, you know, the amount of kinetic energy or the velocity goes as, uh, because the velocity goes as, as energy squared, it would actually, going half as far would only reduce the velocity to like 0.7 meters per second. So I think the navigation was probably very hard. I'm sure there's some discussion. I'm sure there's a paper that discusses this very thing and I can't find it right now because I'm talking to you guys. But I, yeah, I imagine that as you get down closer, the navigation gets much harder because the comet is non-spherical and you, know, you can't just put yourself into a stable orbit. If you're wanting to target a specific region, this was probably the easiest way to do it. And once they were falling, they would have to reorient the spacecraft if they wanted to perform a braking burn on the way down. And that would be also be difficult. And it might make it impossible for them to like do all their science goals, or it might just simply be impossible for the spacecraft to turn that quickly and perform these uh, science, um, you know, science uh, tasks that it was tasked with doing. I did think it was very cool that they actually found one last image months later, like an image which had partially come down through the data system and they'd logged the frames, but they hadn't seen a complete image. So they just hadn't listed that in their final images. And they found, oh, we get a partial image of, we are very, very close to the surface. The spacecraft incidentally, once it touched the surface, it was programmed to just turn itself off. Like, there's no way to recover Rosetta short of going out there to get it. They didn't leave it in some mode where it could turn on next time around, which I think is a mistake, but, you know, some people just don't like spacecraft zapping into their deep space networks uninvited. Konstantinos Bayrak Bayraktaris. That sounds like a Klingon name. Hey Scott, I love your videos. I have an idea of how to refuel spaceships in orbit. The arrangement would be counterweight, center of mass, ship with fuel, ship without fuel. This way, the whole thing would rotate and push fuel towards the empty ship. Would that work? Yes, that would totally work. Uh, what other plans are there for achieving this? For counterweight, you could use another pair of ships. Also, trans Look, yeah, there's no technical reason why you couldn't have spacecraft rotating uh, as, a, as a way to keep the fuel in a manageable state. I mean, sure, you have to manage Coriolis forces and things like this. Um, like, I think what would happen, though, if you think about it, is you would have to dock the two spacecraft to get... Say, say you did it with two spacecraft. You dock them, and then you'd somehow have to spin them up. You'd have to spin them up with engines. And once you start spinning them up with engines, uh, you're using propellant. So why not just give them a little push in this direction? and then have the fuel transfer over. And as the fuel is transferring over, guess what? That also pushes them to the bottom of the tanks. If you look at the way the fuel is moving. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's one option. Or the spinning. The spinning would just work too. Uh, you don't really need a huge amount of propellant to actually... Uh, you don't really need a huge amount of acceleration to, to do the illage thrusters. So, yeah. I think you might have a large station that does that. You might have spinny things inside tanks. You might have membranes that move around inside tanks. You know, you have these, uh, they have another concept, which is basically like a very fine mesh. And the droplets of propellant sort of stick to that via surface tension. And then because of that, then they can be drawn out very slowly. 
uh, you know, you just have to make sure you pull it out at a sufficiently slow velocity that the, the stuff remains together. Okay, so I think I've actually run out of questions. I don't know, I had a longer list of questions, but it seems that I've taken plenty of time answering these. So thanks once again for supporting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these answers and my mad ravings about them. I'm going to obviously continue accepting questions and for the next year I think uh, I'm still doing pretty well. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.